So what I've done here is take, in this case, the Good Samaritan. I chose it as a story I didn't need to tell you. In your work, you'll hardly ever be saying to the children, pretend uh, something very exciting is going to happen today. Instead, you're saying, we've got some evidence and we can guide you to the event. That's what a guidebook is. We are thinking as guides. We can relive for you some of the events of our town. So in writing a guidebook, that's basically... Now, they didn't actually see the event, but they've perceived and studied the events. And they've decided that their audience are people who need leading to some understanding. So the whole thinking and the language is geared to the people who buy this. Will this truly guide them? What sort of drawings, illustrations, what sort of layout make them want to look at it? What's the cover so that they don't buy a pig in a poke? They know they are buying a guide. How shall we divide our guide so that some people may want this kind of information, some people may want the other. Now what doing a guidebook does is make you sift the history. Mm -hmm. To classify it, to sort it, to illustrate it, to research it, obviously. However, if you take the agent stance, you see the guide can only say, well I'm at your disposal if you want to be guided. But the agent is in a much stronger position. The agent, for example, is the one that might look like a plumber and comes along and says, well, I'm telling you this now. You'll not get that tapestry dried out here because there's an awful lot of wet rot round here. But that's the agent. I must help you understand it. It'll never dry like that. The agent has the authority to say, I must help you understand. Now you can't do that with a guidebook because people can pass it by and say I don't want to know. So if you set up a situation in your classroom where the children are agents, they are empowered to have more authority. This is the authority, if we've researched it we know it, but this is the authority that says I'm warning you. You have to understand this if you want that done. So for example, if, they, um, uh, if, if the tapestry is developed to a point where they're deciding where it could be hung in the town, it would be as agent that they went along to the council and explained what this tapestry needs from you. Is this making sense? So the way we talk with them, we are agents, we've got an audience now, or whoever we intend to be going to meet, where we are empowered to say, listen, this has got to be really understood thoroughly. Whether it's advice on how to fill a form in or what, but I'm the agent by which things can be done right. Now in this one, uh, I am the authority, empowers the people more. I am the one that can say if we take our uh, if we take our tapestry and where it should be displayed so that it doesn't break down and everything we've done isn't wasted. Over here you see, well then you may have to put a penny on the rate, I mean I'm just putting money in at the moment. Or it may be, well we'll have to alter this building in order that all the wheelchairs can get in then. If you want school parties to come in then you've got to do something about insurance. And so the children then at that stage would be concerned. I mean, I've chosen not a very good one necessarily, but in this is, I speak not just for, it's very nice to have it hung up now, but think of the repercussions. Are, are, is it going to attract a lot more people to our town? Uh, how, how do we... Uh, Make sure they, they can get to it. How do we make sure it's not vandalised? Results always arise from these decisions. And we've got to be sensible. If we come to this, however, then we are scholarly, aren't we? We're looking at this tapestry and saying, yes, 
I've seen tapestries like this before. Let's compare it with the Bayer tapestry. And so you get this critical comparison between one thing and another. You may walk around your town uh, preparing your guidebook, should that be what you want to do. And we critically look at illustrations we have of other Roman heads or other Norman names and so on. And the critical element of comparison uh, is, is enabled, you see, uh, whereby you, you stretch them to look further. The critical element would come very much into the way the tapestry was developed. Mm. Uh, when we have to fill in what, what needs doing. Now all these are aspects of different kinds of empowerment. You see the artist, one might have uh, the legend that is now, you know, sorted out a bit. But as artists people may come along and start transforming that legend into another work of art. Is it to be danced? Would it make a theatrical production? Would it teach us a fifth year how to write a play? Does that make a little bit of sense to you? I have spoken it to you. I've spoken it, but it's quite tricky to master it. But it starts with just this simple seeming thing of, okay, if I'm gonna have a meeting of the historical society, I'll write historical society and put it on the table. That's the first venturing in. Uh, good evening, we'll start on time and so on and so on. That's the beginning of creating this kind of resonance. From the frame of view of the historical society, we are examining something in the city or the town or, or the castle or whatever it might be.